Welcome. Given a basic knowledge of Zigbee and its architecture, let's start to talk a little bit about the individual layers of the Zigbee stack. At the lowest level, you have the radio, which is your physical layer, and above this is the medium access control, or MAC layer. The MAC layer in Zigbee is based on an 802.15.4 the IEEE standard so that we are going to talk a little bit about what is significant there. 802.15.4 is designed for low power, low data rate networks with a low cost objective in mind. These are generally re referred to as PANs or personal area networks. The idea here is that these would be low to moderate radio range application designs, but amplification is also possible. It's possible to get up to roughly plus 20 dBm output power in most countries. In Europe it's regulated a little bit lower to around plus 10 dBm. But that's enough to get you anywhere from about 1 to 3 kilometers depending on what your link budget is and what kind of application you have and what kind of antenna you have. The raw bit rate is 250 kilobits per second using the 2.4 gigahertz direct sequence spread spectrum phi or DSSS. In the real world, you're going to see about a quarter or a fifth of that. The expected throughput is comparable to a 56k baud modem, around 5,270 kilobits per second on a single hop link. Once you put the multi-hop effects, things will take a little bit longer to propagate. The 802.15.4 standard provides the ability to have multiple networks and multiple PANs on the same channel. Therefore, you need some way to avoid having packets collide over the air because the radio can only really tune in effectively to one packet at a time. You want to make sure that you can avoid having packet collisions. 802.15.4 implements a mode called CSMA-CA or Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Avoidance. Collision avoidance here is done using the CCA or Clear Channel Assessments, meaning before we transmit we're going to look and see if the airwaves are clear in our area with a low noise floor. If we don't have clear air, we back off some random milliseconds amount of time. Even if you have some network-wide event where all the nodes will respond at about the same time, at a specific level the nodes are going to be staggered because of these random backoffs. If there's a period of silence, the nodes are not going to all begin to transmit immediately. So if you get clear air, you back off for a little bit and transmit. If you don't get clear air, you back off a number of back-off periods with several milliseconds before transmitting. This allows multiple nodes to stagger their transmissions so that at some point they all can find a small space of clear air. Even though the bit rate is somewhat low, the packets are also fairly small. They have a 128-byte maximum packet format, including a 16-bit CRC or checksum. Given that the packets are small, the bitrate is generally sufficient enough for these packets to get out fairly well, even if the network is quite busy on that channel. In terms of knowing if your packet made it there or not, you need a way to acknowledge the packet at the link level. 802.15.4 offers MAC layer acknowledgments for a single hop, meaning one source to one destination. This is also known as a link layer acknowledgment. On multi-hop transmissions, every hop gets individual acknowledged. Essentially, the node is going to try to transmit if it gets clear air. It will wait a couple of milliseconds and then go ahead and transmit, which is going to take a couple of more milliseconds. Wait for the MAC acknowledgement, and if it doesn't get the AC, it will continue to retry. The same device will try four or five times to get the same packet across a single hop until it gets the MAC ACK for the receiving party. At Silicon Labs, we take a step further. The Ember ZNet stack 
adds additional MAC retries. After the first retries are tempted, we wait for a little bit and then retry the whole sequence again. We found in our experience that this is generally better than waiting for an end-to-end -end retry mechanism to kick in, which could be a number of seconds later. So, when you are observing Ember Zenit traffic in a bad connectivity scenario, there are going to be a burst of four to five MAC layer transmissions, and if the MAC ACK isn't heard, then the stack will wait 10 to 12 milliseconds and retry again. If there is no response, then it will retry one more time before the individual end-to-end -end is considered a failure. At this point, it's up to higher level protocols to decide if it's supposed to retry or not. In regard to the frequencies available to 802.15.4, the specification allows for a few different bands dependent on the different frequency zones. 2.4 GHz is the most common because it's globally unlicensed, meaning you don't need any special permission to use that channel allocation. You, however, will need to go through basic compliance testing with FCC, CE, or ETSI, or whatever your region requires. In the 2.4 GHz band, you have 16 channels running from a center frequency of 2.405 GHz all the way up to 2.480 GHz. There are also sub-GHz bands at 915 and 868 MHz. These frequencies are not as popular. At the physical layer, or phi, the ranges we mentioned could be roughly two kilometers with line of sight. This is with a fair amount of application and still within legal limits in most areas. And because of all the channels, you have robust communications such that you can avoid interference by making sure you pick channels that are not terribly noisy. Now, if you do pick a channel and it becomes noisy, Zigbee has the high-level response with what they call frequency agility, so that some network manager can move the network to a different channel. The other advantage to the 2.4 GHz spectrum is that it's available globally, which means you have a wide install base for your products. A common question that we get is, what about Wi-Fi? What about 802.11 IEEE? Most prominent range where Zigbee channels are uses the channel selection shown in these graphs. Now even though there's actually a separate range of channels between Europe and North America, in our experience, networks are deployed on the North American channels even in Europe, just because vendors tend to ship with the default Wi-Fi setting for North America and most devices tend not to shy away from that norm. What Zigbee tries to avoid is any of these channels that overlap Wi-Fi, so it works fairly well having a Zigbee network on top of Wi-Fi networks. We have plenty of customers coexisting happily, even in the same box as the Wi-Fi transmitter. In the diagrams above, you can see there are a couple of gaps in the spectrum, and those are places on the edges of the band where a Zigbee network from office profiles are likely to form. One thing to keep in mind is the high-end channel 26 and even some extent channel 25. These channels are very close to the edge in the band and there's a tightly regulated band just outside of this area. If you do select these higher channels, be aware that you're generally going to have to limit your output power to satisfy FCC requirements because some of the signal energy will bleed outside the spectrum into these regulated bands that your radio is not supposed to be in. So, for this very reason, a lot of manufacturers will tend to avoid channel 26 or artificially limit the output of the channel to prevent any kind of RF compliance issues. As far as making coexistence possible between 802.15.4 networks and either other 15.4 networks, existing IEEE networks like 802.11, Zigbee, or Bluetooth, these standard based protocols are designed to coexist peacefully. And because 802.15.4 has a collision avoidance mechanism with CCA that helps reduce packet collisions, you have a better chance of getting your packets through even when there's a fair amount of interference in that area. 
802.11n standard does use some of the same channels as 802.11b and g in terms of frequency usage. It means that there will still be intermediate spaces between Wi-Fi channels that Zigbee will be able to participate in without worrying about interference. There is the possibility of channel bonding in 802.11 where you use two adjacent channels and kind of stretch your bandwidth across them. But that's something that's really only done in the 5 gigahertz range, not in the 2.4 gigahertz range. So it's not something you have to worry about. Keep in mind that because Silicon Labs has many customers deploying thousands or millions of these devices in the field, we have a good sense that the coexistence here is viable in real world scenarios. We've had customers do white papers on them, and if you contact Silicon Labs support, we can refer you to the various white papers that discuss coexistence between 802.15.4, Zigbee networks, and other kinds of networks in the 2.4 gigahertz area. I hope this video has been helpful for the Mac and Phi layers. If there are any comments or questions about the video, please post it to our community. Thank you.